Now it is time for the last word with my friend Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. Mary Trump <clears throat> is going to join us to share her thoughts on how she thinks her uncle's feeling as Letitia James closes in on his assets. We'll see, uh, how, we'll see how that goes. That is going to be a very worthwhile conversation. Yeah, and, and Alex, uh, you know, I have a feeling, I could be wrong, I have a feeling I've been arrested more than you have, uh, but <laughs> I've never I'm been... I'm going to venture to say that's probably true. Okay. Um, it's all in my first book, by the way, if you must know. Yes. Uh, I, but I've never been re-arrested. And so the FBI did that today to the Republicans' star witness in the uh, in, in the so-called Biden impeachment process. But uh, Andrew Weissman used to work at the FBI, so he's going to explain to me how you get re-arrested and yes. why you get re-arrested for the same thing. So that's mm. coming up, too. I'm going to say I don't think... Um I don't think Alexander Smirnoff and is the only one that's interested in the rearrest concept. I'm not going to say who else in the Republican Party might be. Just putting it out there. <laughs> right, right. Have a good Thank show. you, Alex. Thank you. Well, our first guest tonight said this about her uncle. He is quite simply a loser. Mary Trump knows more about Donald Trump than any of us ever will. And Mary Trump is sure that what you are about to hear Letitia James, the Attorney General Letitia James, say after winning a half-billion-dollar civil fraud judgment against Donald Trump will push him closer to the edge. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, uh, then we will seek, uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court, and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. We are prepared to make sure that the judgment is paid to New Yorkers. And yes, I look at 40 Wall Street each and every day. Mary Trump writes, knowing Donald as I do, here's why I know this statement will push him closer to the edge. First, James implies that there's a possibility Donald does not have enough cash to satisfy the judgment. That alone is enough to enrage him. James took it a step further we are prepared to make sure that the judgment is paid to New Yorkers. And yes, I look at 40 Wall Street each and every day, James said, referring to the Trump building in Manhattan. 40 Wall Street is the building that Donald Trump proudly proclaimed on 9-11, suddenly became the tallest building in lower Manhattan immediately after the World Trade Center towers collapsed after a terrorist attack. I mean, 40 Wall Street actually was the second tallest building in downtown Manhattan. And, and it was actually before the World Trade Center was the tallest. And then when they built the World Trade Center, it became known as the second tallest. And now it's the tallest. That's what was actually happening. What was on the screen was what was actually happening while Donald Trump was saying that. The World Trade Center was burning. It was on its way to collapse. And all Donald Trump cared about when he was far away from that danger zone, the only thing that he could think about was the size of his building in lower Manhattan. He wasn't even slightly worried that he might have lost a friend in the rubble at the World Trade Center. In fact, he didn't know anyone who died that day and never went to a single 9-11 funeral, although years later he lied about that and said that he, quote, lost hundreds of friends on 9-11, end quote. That was a complete lie. He lost no friends on 9-11. But he now could lose 40 Wall Street if that is what it takes to pay the judgment against him. Donald Trump's cognitive decline continues in plain view. We're going to take over Washington, D.C. We're going to federalize. We're going to have very powerful crime. And you're going to be proud of it again. We're going to have very powerful crime. And you're going to be proud of it. Now imagine how many headlines there would be about that story if Joe Biden had said those exact words. Donald Trump gets to say, we're going to have very powerful crime, and you're going to be proud of it. And no one in the news media even notices. In Donald Trump's declining mind, he probably thought he was saying something, 
But the words that came out were idiotic. And that happens all the time. They come out with uh, faucets where no water comes out. You know, if you go and buy a home, and they know what I mean, the showers, you stand under a shower and there's no water coming, and you're saying, you're, you end up standing there five times longer. Again, imagine how the media would react if Joe Biden said that. And think about what Donald Trump just said. Donald Trump thinks that if a shower produces no water, you actually have to stand there five times longer. Think about that. Think about how that mind works. How long would you stay in your shower if no water was coming out? Wouldn't you get out of there a lot faster if no water is coming out? If someone told you that no water was coming out of their shower, would you then assume that they stay in the shower five times longer? That's how Donald Trump's mind works in cognitive decline. Donald Trump said, and apparently believes, because of his cognitive decline, quote, they come out with faucets where no water comes out. We will get Mary Trump's assessment of Donald Trump's cognitive decline in a moment. But for those of you who might not have heard Donald Trump speak 25 years ago, when he was 52 years old, I found an amazing example of how Donald Trump spoke then in the brilliant Rick Burns, brother of Ken Burns, documentary series about New York City produced in 1999. Imagine my amazement watching an episode of that documentary which tells the story of New York City from the arrival of the Dutch to the present day, using the insights of brilliant historians and New Yorkers and New York legends like Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was an authoritative historian of New York in his own right, a series of distinguished, wise voices. And then to suddenly hear a voice begin off screen and sound strangely familiar, but it couldn't be that voice, could it? The reason the great skyscrapers went up in Manhattan is that Manhattan is an island of very powerful bedrock. It's granite and basically very, very high density rock that frankly digging foundations is unbelievably difficult. You have to blast to build in Manhattan. And the buildings went up in Manhattan because of the power of that bedrock. Once you dig that foundation, and when they dig, they really dig. They, they dig with dynamite. And once you dynamite out and you secure that foundation, that building isn't going anywhere. Every word of that is true. Who is that guy? That is not the same mind you're listening to today. Donald Trump went from saying that accurate and informative statement about building in New York City 25 years ago to now saying they come out with faucets where no water comes out. The showers, you stand under a shower and there is no water coming out. And you say you end up standing there five times longer. What happened to that mind? over the last 25 years, and what is happening to that mind tonight? As Attorney General of New York, Letitia James, closes in on Donald Trump's assets. For the answer, we turn to uh, uh, Mary Trump, a clinical psychologist and niece of Donald Trump. She is the author of The Reckoning, Our Nation's Trauma, and Finding a Way to Heal. Uh, Mary Trump, thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I immediately thought of you uh, Sunday night, uh, sitting there enthralled by this documentary series about New York City. And, I, and it was just like I said, I heard, I heard that voice. The camera's not on him. And I heard a little bit more. And then there he was. And I, and I was just stunned. It, it's completely clear. Those are your sentences. It's a paragraph. Everything's true. It's a serious point. 
about how you actually build on this island and why you're able to build so high on this island. And then I'm hearing him talk about people are buying faucets that water doesn't come out of. What happened? What happened from the guy I, who said that and was able to say that in 1999 about construction and now doesn't know how faucets work? Well, Lawrence, I think a couple of things are going on. And, and one is perhaps the, the most obvious. This is a person who has untreated uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, and any untreated disorder of any kind worsens over time um, as long as it remains untreated. Uh, so it, it makes perfect sense that somebody who is unhealthy as he is, who is under the extraordinary amount of stress he's under, would have a harder time holding it together cognitively. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting, um, before I get to the second point, is that Donald was always quite good uh, when he was younger at sticking to a point, and mm -hmm. uh, you know he he knew certain things about uh, his business, uh, so he could say perfectly reasonable statements like that with confidence. And let's let's be fair. He's very, he was very good uh, at being in the media. And that's one of the main reasons my grandfather chose him to be his successor, uh, because he had that kind of presence. Um, so the second point, though, that it struck me in, in watching that is that his target audience is cha has changed dramatically in the ensuing decades. He used to be focused on becoming a part of New York City's upper crust inner circle. He desperately wanted to be part of that milieu. He desperately wanted to be accepted by his betters, which is how he perceived them. And now he appeals to an audience that appreciates the kind of anecdotes about showers that don't produce water and that uh, is full of the kind of invective and hatred that he has now become expert at. So I think those two things kind of track together. I, I was struck by what you've written about um, where he is in relation to the edge as a result of uh, New York State Attorney General Letitia James closing in on him. And that specific line she said in that television interview about she looks at 40 Wall Street every day. Uh, is it your sense that Attorney General James has figured out two things, how to beat Donald Trump in court and how to drive him absolutely insane with statements like that? Yeah, she has his number uh, for sure. And anybody who's from New York who has been paying any attention for the last many decades knows what makes him tick. And what's so fascinating about this latest chapter in his life is that he's finally reached the end of the road. Um, when he was taking over for my grandfather or when he was my grandfather's successor and the one who was going to fill my grandfather's ambitions, he had, he didn't need skill. He just need his skill as a real estate developer. He just needed the skill as the arrogant, self-confident, brash guy who played well on television. Um, my grandfather always had hundreds of millions of dollars to prop him up. Um, we know that when, after my grandfather died, Donald sold the empire lock, stock and barrel at a loss of approximately $300 million. So he still had some cash on hand to keep it going. And then he kept getting rehabilitated and rehabilitated. A.G. James knows better than anybody else that there's nobody else left to hand Donald a blank check anymore. And that's what keeps him up at night because he is terrified of having the truth about him be known, not just to other people, but to himself, because that's what's kept him going all these times, all, all these years. The lie that has become in his own mind, the truth about what a great, successful man he is. So he his uh, criminal trial in Manhattan uh, starts uh, Monday, March 25th with jury selection. Uh, you get I get the sense from him from my distance that he is more disturbed at civil judgments that force him to pay money uh, than he is at being criminally indicted where there isn't necessarily any sort of fine involved. 
You're absolutely right. And there are two reasons for this. The, the most obvious one is that money in my family was always the only currency. It stood in for everything else. The more you have, the more you, you're worth. As long as you have more than other people, you're worth more in every sense of what that word means. And the other thing that's really important uh, to keep in mind is that he no longer cares about the criminal trials because one, they won't necessarily cost him money, but two, they increase his street cred with his base and with the Republican Party, which is a very devastating commentary on where we are as a country. Uh, so as you go forward uh, this year, uh, w when we're looking at what is bringing him to the edge, we should keep our minds, our eyes more on the civil cases and how is he coming up with the money and how is he getting through that than what's going to happen to him in the criminal trials? Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case, Lawrence. Mary Trump, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Always glad to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And coming up, $87,502. That's how much Donald Trump's civil fraud judgment goes up every day because of interest on that judgment. That's next with Andrew Weissman and Barbara McQuaid. Today, the FBI informant who has been indicted for lying to the FBI about Joe Biden and his son, Hunter Biden, was rearrested by the FBI in Las Vegas. Alexander Smirnov had been ordered released by a magistrate judge on Tuesday, but today prosecutors asked a federal judge in California to detain him. Also today, Donald Trump owes another $87,502. That's how much the civil fraud judgment against Donald Trump goes up every day. A new analysis by ABC News says former President Donald Trump owes an additional $87,502 in post-judgment interest every day until he pays the $354 million fine ordered by Judge Arthur Ngoron in his civil fraud case, according to ABC News calculations. Based on the judge's lengthy ruling in the case, Ngoron ordered Trump to pay prejudgment interest on each ill-gotten gain with interest accruing based on the date of each transaction, as well as a 9% post-judgment interest rate once the court enters the judgment in the case. And today, Judge Ngoron refused to allow any delay in entering the judgment in the case. At the last minute today, Donald Trump's lawyers emailed Judge Arthur Ngoron saying, as the court is well aware, the monitor that the court appointed remains in place. As such, there is no exigency or potential prejudice to the attorney general from a brief stay of enforcement of the judgment. To the contrary, the prejudice to the defendants is considerable. The judge replied, dear Mr. Robert, you have failed to explain, much less justify any basis for a stay. I am confident that the appellate division will protect your appellate rights. Judge Ed Gorin has obviously run out of patience with the clown car of Trump lawyers and Donald Trump, who so unprofessionally disrupted his courtroom and humiliated themselves in the process. Joining our discussion now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He is the co-host of the MSNBC podcast, Prosecuting Donald Trump. And also with us, he's also the co-author of the new book, The Trump Indictments, the Historic Charging Documents with Commentary, available on February 27th. And Barbara McQuaid is with us, a former U.S. attorney and law professor at the University of Michigan Law School. She is also the co-host of the podcast Sisters in Law and the author of the upcoming book, Attack from Within, How Disinformation is Sabotaging America. They're both MSNBC legal analysts. Uh, Andrew Weissman... How do you get yourself rearrested by the FBI? Uh, you used to work there. You must have seen this before. No, I haven't. Oh, okay, uh, good. I actually, That's great. We finally found something that you haven't seen before while you're at the FBI. Yeah, so the, the circumstances where you would get rearrested would be if you are committing an additional crime, something new. 
that could happen. You did one crime, you're out on bail, and guess what? You're, you're a recidivist and you commit another crime. You could be rearrested. What I have not seen, and I was asking around when I saw this, is being an arrest warrant being issued and being rearrested for the same crime. And the problem with that is a judge had already determined that he should be out on bail. You can appeal that. Um, that is the right of the government. They can say that's wrong. They could seek a stay. Those are the remedies. You don't really get to take the law in your own hands and say, you know what, I want to rearrest you. You needed to go back to the judge. And you don't do that ex parte. You don't do that on your own. You do that with the defense because they should be heard. The only possible thing I could think of when I was trying to think how could this be proper and not just an affront to the judiciary is if for some reason uh, the government has new information about some imminent flight that Mr. Smirnoff was you know, planning and they thought it was they couldn't even tell the defense because they needed to get their hands on him. But I think that's remote. But that's the only thing I could think of that would justify this. It really doesn't seem respectful for the way you're supposed to behave, especially when you're the government. Uh, Barbara, have you ever seen anything like it? I haven't. And I agree with Andrew's assessment of it. It's, it's really unusual. Nothing I have seen before. I do note, though, that on the docket in the Central District of California, where the indictment was filed, there is reporting that there were sealed items on the docket sheet. So it suggests there has been some additional activity there. And so, you know, that supports Andrew's theory that perhaps uh, there is more information here than is publicly known. I'll also say that I was very surprised that the magistrate judge released Smirnov in light of the circumstances, his contacts with Russian intelligence, his family ties in Israel, his access to $6 million. I mean, this is a classic case of a risk of flight. And so it does seem that perhaps the government was very concerned about this. So before I say they've done something uh, that's wrong or highly irregular, I guess I'd like to know what is in those sealed filings that are on that docket sheet. Uh, Andrew Weissman, uh, $87,502 a day is uh, the price increase for Donald Trump on the uh, civil fraud judgment uh, in New York that Attorney General Letitia James obtained. Uh, there's reporting today about Donald Trump uh, shopping around to different companies trying to get some kind of bond to cover this what would be uh, more than half a billion dollars that he would he would have to put down in order to pursue the appeal here. And so far, uh, no companies are interested. There was one expert saying no company wants to take buildings as collateral in a situation like this. That that just leaves them stuck trying to sell a building down the road when this thing derails. Uh, what do you see happening here? Well, I think it's important for people to remember that the reason that Donald Trump is in this position is because after a full trial where he could present evidence, he actually testified, he could cross-examine, the judge entered this order saying, this is the amount that I'm disgorging of ill-gotten gains, as if the analogy would be he robbed a bank and he has you know, $400 million, and the judge says, that is now got to be returned. Um, and every day that you don't pay, there is interest on that because we're not letting you profit from your intentional fraud that the court found. So that's why he's in this situation. Um, and the reason he needs to post this in court is so that the citizens of New York are protected while that appeal is pending so that their assets if the appeal is denied, which I suspect it will be, that there is money there. Um, I think it's going to be very hard for him uh, to figure out how he's going to pay this absent coming up with some third party beneficiary, a sort of Elon Musk or a foreign person or country who is actually going to loan him the money. Uh, and that obviously has political repercussions uh, in terms of, you know, the, how he will feel beholden to that person 
if he were to be in office again. Yeah, a compromised man becomes even more compromised. Uh, and Barbara McQuaid, uh, just so the audience understands, this is standard in civil cases. If there's a judgment against you and you want to appeal it, there's going to be interest. And for some litigants, it's one of the reasons they don't appeal, because they make this assessment, you know, we probably won't win. And then we'll owe even more money because of the interest at the end of the line. And so they enter into some sort of uh, usually negotiated settlement at that point to to get out of this. And so there's nothing there's nothing unusual about interest. Donald Trump's lawyers should have told him that was coming. Yeah, no, no surprise here. You know, they, they did ask for a stay, for a delay so that uh, they could appeal and, and work out, uh, you know, some sort of bond situation before it happens. And the judge said, you know, you haven't explained why that's necessary, why it's appropriate. Uh, and so, no, uh, you're, you're not getting that. Um, the other reason, though, that, that this rule exists, Lawrence, is to avoid people taking frivolous appeals solely for the purpose of delaying the payment of their debt. A judgment has been entered against Donald Trump. And so for every day he fails to pay that, he is accruing interest. If that money really belongs to the people of New York, they should have the benefit of that money. And so that's how interest works, that uh, when you're holding my money, you have to pay for that right. And so every day that Donald Trump holds this, he owes a debt. Uh, and that is an incentive to cause him to pay the judgment. Barbara McQuaid and Andrew Weissman, thank you for joining our discussion tonight. And Barbara, before you go, when is your book available? Tuesday, February 27th, and I will see you that night on set, Lawrence. Perfect, perfect. We will see you then. Thank you very much for joining us Thank tonight. You. And coming up, while it is hard at this stage of a professional, of a presidential election to trust the polls, it does help to be the candidate on the same side of issues like abortion access, gun control, and health care, and in vitro fertilization. Simon Rosenberg will join us next. I, for one, have little faith in polls because of my formative experience with polls in the first year that I was involved in a political campaign, 1988. And on July 22nd, 1988, the Gallup poll showed Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis with a 17-point lead over the vice president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, in the presidential campaign, a 17-point lead. On election day, George Bush won by eight points, 53 to 45. So that poll in July was only off by 25 points of what the final result would be. And I mentioned that by way of apology because I am now going to present a poll to you in which I have little faith because it is even farther away from the election than that Dukakis 17-point lead. The Quinnipiac University poll of registered voters released yesterday shows President Biden at 49, Donald Trump at 45. That is a statistical tie within the margin of error of the poll, but it always feels a little better when you see your candidate with the higher number. Last night at this hour, during a fundraiser in San Francisco, President Biden described the stakes in this presidential election campaign, saying, quote, We can't take anything for granted. Trump and his mega friends are dividing us, not uniting us. If you notice, they have no platform." You never see a party that has doesn't have any platform going, no platform going into an election, none. Every major meeting I go to internationally, as I walk out of the meetings, a head of state will find an excuse to come up close to me and grab my arm and say, you've got to win. Not because I'm so special. You've got to win because my democracy is at stake if the other guy wins. Nine heads of state have done that with me. Nine. The stakes in the election also include health care, with Donald Trump promising once again to repeal Obamacare, which is now supported by 59 percent of adults and opposed, opposed by 39 percent. The stakes also include, we discovered this week, in vitro fertilization. Couples who've been struggling to have a baby are now targeted enemies of the Republican Party targeted enemies of the kinds of judges another Trump presidency would appoint. A reelected Joe Biden would continue to appoint federal judges who believe in reproductive freedom for women and 
for couples' rights to use in vitro fertilization. Vice President Kamala Harris outlined more of the stakes in the election today, saying, when we win Democratic majorities in Congress, President Joe Biden will sign the following into law, a bill that reinstates the protections of Roe versus Wade, an assault weapons ban, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and Freedom to Vote Act, and more. Elections matter. Donald Trump and every Republican member of Congress opposes every one of those things. Joining our discussion now is Simon Rosenberg, Democratic strategist and author of the Hopium Chronicles on Substack. So, uh, Simon, Donald Trump came in second last time, which means he has to get more votes this time <laughs> than he got last time. And yeah. I have not heard him say a single thing on a single issue to try to convince a voter who didn't vote for him last time hmm. to vote for him this time. Doesn't Donald Trump have to change voters' minds about him to win? Yeah, look, I think this is a really important point. I mean, Donald Trump is a far weaker candidate than he was in, in 2020. He's much further away from the electorate. He's far more degraded but, you know, by the court cases and the things you were describing earlier. He's far more extreme. He's far more dangerous. You know, his performance on the stump is far more erratic and disturbing. I mean, he's sort of gone into this kind of madness when he's talking now. And, you know, he's I think there are going to be six things in this uh, election that people are going to come to learn about Donald Trump that they didn't know about him last time that I think are going to make it very difficult for him to win, right? That he raped E. Jean Carroll in a department store dressing room, that he oversaw one of the largest financial frauds in American history, that he stole America's secrets, lied to the FBI, and shared them with other people, that he led an insurrection against the United States and has promised to finish the job if he's elected, that he and his family corruptly have taken more money from foreign governments than any family in American history. And now we have this ongoing extremism around reproductive freedom and health that is just shocking. And he's singularly responsible for ushering in this kind of assault on women and, and freedoms and their, and their personal freedoms. And I think all of these together, to me, paint a picture, you know, blind man and the elephant. When you put the whole elephant together, this is the ugliest political offering that we've seen in America since the 1850s in the Democratic Party in those days. This is an ugly and, uh, and diminished figure. And I think that the idea that somehow you can look at all this and see Donald Trump with strength rather than weakness and and uh, and him doing well rather than struggling, I think is a little bit too far. It's a bridge too far, I think, in the political commentary these days. So the the strongest issue that Donald Trump has going for him was the strongest issue he had going for him last time and as distinguishing from Joe Biden. And that is uh, the security of the southern border. Yeah. Uh, he lost last time uh, running yeah. on, on that issue against Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden has more vulnerability about it now because he's been in charge of the southern border as president. But we have a situation where Donald Trump yeah. ordered the Republicans in the United States Senate to abandon the bill they negotiated themselves and ordered House Republicans not to vote for that bill, which would have been the biggest legislative advance in security at the southern border <laughs> in possibly the history of the southern border. I mean, and just, so he, yeah. he took away in that, in that way uh, much of his own issue. Listen, they've, all of their talking points about Biden have evaporated in the last few months, right? The economy is strong. It, it isn't weak. Inflation isn't raging. It's way down. Crime isn't exploding across the country. R murder rates and, cr and violent crime rates are dropping. There isn't any kind of war on energy. We saw more domestic oil and renewables produced last year than any year in American history. And so what they had left was the border and immigration, right? This was their big issue. And they and they bungled it badly because of Trump's impulsivity, his madness, his craziness, that he somehow believes that by keeping the border open and immigrants flowing into the country, it's going to help him. And we just saw this litigated in New York three. Right. This was the major issue in the New York race. And we won that race by eight points, because what Tom Swazi was able to say is if you want the border to be secure and for there to be order on the border and fewer immigrants coming into the country, then you should work with Democrats. If you want the border to be chaotic and chaos in cities with immigrants pouring into the cities, then you should be with the Republicans, right? How they put themselves in this position is one of the biggest political errors 
errors uh, that we've seen in recent elections. And I think it's it goes back to this idea that he's descended into this form of madness and extremism and that he's impulsive and that he's making extraordinary mistakes that are going to make it much easier for us to win. And so in every way possible, Lawrence, I have this basic view. Joe Biden has been a good president. The country's better off. The Democratic Party is strong and winning elections all over the country. And they have Trump, the most unfit guy to ever run for president in American history. I'll take those odds as we head into November. Simon Roseberg, thank you very much for joining us again tonight. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you. Coming up, while Donald Trump continues to compare his legal problems with what Alexei Navalny went through before Vladimir Putin assassinated him, today the president of the United States met with Alexei Navalny's widow, and pledged to announce major new sanctions against Russia for the assassination of Alexei Navalny. Yale University history professor Timothy Snyder joins us next. The stakes in the presidential election are clear. A Republican candidate who promises to behave like a murderous Russian dictator and a Democratic candidate who said and did this today. This morning I had the honor of meeting with Alexei Navalny's wife and daughter. As you state the obvious, he was a man of incredible courage. And it's amazing how his wife and daughter are, are emulating that. And we're going to be announcing the sanctions against Putin, who is responsible for his death, tomorrow. And uh, but the one thing I made that was made clear to me is that uh, Yolanda is going to, she's going to continue to the fight he had on the way. So we're not letting up. And Alexei Navalny's mother says that she was finally allowed to view her son's body Wednesday night in a Russian morgue. While there, she says she was threatened and blackmailed by Russian authorities to hold a secret funeral for her son without any mourners. Alexei Navalny's mother says that if she did not agree to a secret funeral, Russian officials told her they would, quote, do something with her son's body. In his latest article, our next guest, Yale history professor Timothy Snyder, explains why Donald Trump sees so much of himself in Vladimir Putin. Trump is a wannabe oligarch who says that should he become president again, he will round up and imprison his political opponents. He wants to be able to do with all Americans what Putin did to Navalny. And like Putin, he will claim to be the victim as he does so. The weak man always says that he is the victim. Joining our discussion now is Timothy Snyder, professor of history at Yale University. He is the author of The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America. Uh, professor Snyder, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I've been eager to talk to you this week uh, after the tragedy of uh, Alexei Navalny's murder last week. And I, I just want to begin with your reflections on Alexei Navalny, what he has meant to Russia and what his martyrdom will mean to Russia? Well, the, the most important thing to say about, about Alexei Navalny, I think, is that he was a courageous person in a, in a time when I worry that fear is rising in our politics and where fear is so important to the collapse of democracy around the world. He was courageous. He was courageous enough to tell the Russian people that they were being ruled by crooks and thieves. He was courageous enough to return to Russia after he'd been poisoned, knowing that he would be imprisoned. He was courageous enough to tell the truth about oligarchy, which is something we could all use. I think his, his death um, not only deprives Russia of a hope for a different future, it's an example of how Putin has tried to crush the generation younger than him and the generations younger than that. It's a sign of how a kind of authoritarian gerontocracy is removing the future from Russia. Is there something uh, in the Russian people that uh, that somehow supports this kind of heroism? Because it's it's so difficult for me to think of a contemporary American counterpart. We have Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, decades ago, but a contemporary American counterpart to Alexei Navalny 
is is hard to imagine. And I, I think of uh, Nadia Tolokonikova and others who've spent years uh, in Russian prisons and still are in this fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can't help but think, of course, also of the, the numerous Ukrainian citizens, not just prisoners of war, but simply Ukrainian citizens who've been kidnapped and are held in Russian prisons, and the numerous Ukrainian intellectuals, writers, um, people of culture, people, all, people of all walks of life who are courageously fighting against Russia and risking their lives right now. Many other people have been killed by Putin, sadly, since Navalny was killed. I think that Russians... Uh, that there is a proud Russian liberal tradition of risking one's life for the truth. And I think the people who do it know that the truth of uh, the truth is, is in a way the very last resort. It's the last thing that you have. And I think that it, that is why you will see uh, along with Navalny among the list of people who have been killed by Putin, so many journalists. Uh, what does the, what are the stakes as you see them tonight? in a presidential election uh, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden on the issues we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, N Navalny, Nav one of Navalny's most important things that he said was, don't be afraid. And that really is the fulcrum. If, if you're the Republican Party and you're afraid of Trump, you've already given up on democracy. If you're the Democrats and, and you're afraid instead of trying to win, then you've got to bet, then your chances are lower in, in November. Um, if you're Trump, what you've already said is that you want to lock up your opponents, just like Putin locks up his opponents. So it's we could go in that direction if we elect the wrong person. Um, things can go very quickly the wrong way. We could look much more like that country. We could look much more like a country where there, where there's a widow and a daughter who are grieving. We could look much more like that country where a mother can't even get access to the body of her son. And it can happen very quickly. There are unfortunately politicians in our country who like that model. So I'd say that pretty much everything is at stake. Timothy Snyder, thank you very much for joining us once again tonight. Thank My you. pleasure. We'll be right back. Professor Timothy Snyder gets tonight's last word.